Good afternoon. The eminent soldier scholar JFC Fuller believed that in the first instance, the fighting power of a defence force lies in its organisation. Foremost amongst the essential components of a successful organisation is its senior management, that is, the leadership. At a time of extreme social and technological change, epitomised by the notion of a fourth industrial revolution, a fair case can be made that the leadership of Australia's air power and the organisational model those leaders instinctively favour may be unsuited for the task ahead. Few, if any, organisations are more intensely socialised than Western Defence Forces. And within that predetermined cultural environment, no one group is more dominant than Air Force pilots, who, since air power was first applied systematically in World War I, have led their service. I'd like to explore this point by referencing the celebrated American author, Tom Wolfe. In 1979, Wolfe published a book about America's first astronauts, titled The Right Stuff. It was a bestseller and was subsequently made into a movie. All of those early astronauts were required to be fast jet test pilots, a qualification which seemed relevant to the assumed nature of space exploration, and also suggested that they had the right stuff to succeed in this new domain of aeronautics. Wolfe's entertaining story at times teased the jet pilot's highly developed sense of self-regard. But having had his fun, Wolfe nevertheless concluded that those space pioneers deserved their admiration and that they did indeed have the right stuff. A parallel can be drawn between the requirement for those first astronauts to have been fast jet pilots and the tradition that most senior Air Force posts must be filled by strike fighter pilots. Indeed, it's not so much a tradition as an article of faith that that fraternity alone has had the right stuff to command air power. Taking the RAAF as an example, since the Australian Air Force was formed in 1921, every one of the 25 men who's held the office of chief has been a pilot, and of that number, 22 can be classified as strike fighter pilots. We're privileged, by the way, that one of the three exceptions was our keynote speaker today, Air Chief Marshal Houston. Before discussing this organisational phenomenon as it relates to the 21st century, it must be acknowledged that in the broader scheme of things, thus far, those men have done an exceptional, exceptional job. Since mid-1944, when Allied Air Forces began to assert air, air supremacy in all theatres of World War II, Western air power has represented a military comparative advantage, arguably unequalled in any combat domain in the history of warfare. Advanced Western air forces haven't merely controlled the air for the past 70 years, they've dominated it. And they've simultaneously become an essential component of almost any reasonably sized campaign on land or at sea. That's not to say that air dominance has necessarily ensured political victory, whatever that might mean, but it is to say that in discharging their brief, the West's air commanders have been extraordinarily successful. Many complex and varied factors have contributed to that success, but I'm going to suggest that there have been two that have defined the essence of air warfare as we've known it for 100 years. I'm then going to suggest that in the 21st century, those factors might no longer obtain. The first factor concerns why air forces exist, and the second concerns how air forces have gone about discharging the why of their existence. First, the why. Like navies and armies, when you get down to the basics, air forces exist to apply organised violence in the interests of the state. It's true that modern defence forces do much more than that. Peacekeeping, disaster relief, border protection, nation building, research and development, and so on. However, other organisations such as emergency services, NGOs, coast guards, industry and private security firms can be used for those tasks. But in democratic societies, only defence forces can legitimately apply violence against another state. As a former chief of the United States Air Force, General Ron Fogelman memorably put it, a military force's unique purpose is to kill people and break their stuff. Second, the how. In discharging their duty to the state, Air Force commanders have from the earliest days correctly understood that their prime responsibility 
has resided in mastering two roles, namely control of the air and strike. It's again true that air forces do much more than that, but it's those two roles that have been at the heart of air warfare and that have defined the best air forces. Consequently, it's been the exclusive first-hand exposure of combat pilots to the associated warfighting concepts, tactics, technologies and situational awareness that explains why that fraternity has dominated the command of air power and why its members have had the right stuff. It's noteworthy that the three most significant air power thinkers since World War II, John Boyd, John Warden and David Deptula, have all been fighter pilots. The problem for future leaders, however, is that the traditional how and why organisational protocols no longer apply. The model that served the West so well is in the process of being challenged by non-state actors and the ineluctable march of technology. Taking the rise of non-state actors, the application of offensive air power is no longer the sole preserve of states, air forces and military pilots. The most devastating airstrike since the atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945 occurred not in Korea or Vietnam or Iraq or the Balkans or Afghanistan, but in New York City on the 11th of September 2001. Al-Qaeda's attack was an astonishing event. For four hours, a non-state organisation that didn't have professional pilots or aircraft or weapons, let alone an air force, asserted control of the air overhead continental United States by subterfuge. And its destruction of the World Trade Center changed the world. Now, the specific model may not be replicated in the future, but the anarchical thinking behind it certainly will. And that anarchical thinking will be empowered by the fourth industrial revolution. I'll elaborate on that proposition shortly, but first, we need to have a clear understanding of the foundations of traditional advanced air forces. An advanced air force can only be constructed and sustained by countries that possess all of the following resources. A developed economy, a highly educated population, a strong industrial base, and a sophisticated infrastructure. Consequently, by my reckoning today, no more than about a dozen countries, including Australia, have first-rate air forces. Unfortunately for those countries, again including Australia, the technologies that are empowering the fourth industrial revolution will disrupt the established order and will revolutionise who can apply air power and how. Those technologies include autonomous swarming, unmanned systems, robotics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, cyber systems, 3D printing, high definition quantum sensors and hypersonic missiles. By offering alternative means of achieving control of the air and conducting strategic strike, those rapidly evolving and comparatively cheap capabilities will allow previously marginalised players, non-state, third world, assorted extremists, even individuals, to contest the established order. I want to emphasise the profound importance of the fourth industrial revolution by using artificial intelligence as an example. In an article that hasn't received sufficient attention, former American Secretary of State Henry Kissinger has provided a compelling and disturbing analysis of the power and potential of AI. It's near impossible to read Kissinger's analysis, ominously titled How the Enlightenment Ends, without concluding that we're a defining moment in world history. Kissinger's judgment is shared by, among others, Australia's chief scientist, Professor Alan Finkel, who believes that AI is poised to disrupt almost every fabric of Australian society. Other emerging technologies invite a similar conclusion, uh, albeit less dramatically. The question now becomes, what does that mean for the RAAF? In terms of the quality of its people, platforms, weapons, training, systems and infrastructure, the RAAF of 2019 is the best it's ever, ever been. For its size, there is no better Air Force in the world. We can reasonably expect the existing force structure will continue to provide Australia with regional air superiority for the next three to five years. 
But what happens then? If we were tasked with designing an Air Force with a blank sheet of paper, that is, free from the influence of legacy organisations, capabilities and thinking, what would it look like? In an era of transformative technologies in which the pace and nature of change is extreme and constantly increasing, is it rational to believe that we'd arrive at the same kind of organisational arrangement as exists today, an arrangement that effectively has been the same for 75 years? The F-35 exemplifies this abstraction. While the F-35 is an exceptional weapons system, the RWF is fortunate that the platform and its support systems are almost in place rather than being five or ten years ago. The issue is it's taken 27 years to progress the F-35 from design development to operational readiness, and each platform is costing $100 million. Similar numbers can be provided for most combat aircraft. I'd suggest that those numbers are unsustainable when autonomous drones and long-range missiles can be developed in less than one-tenth of both the time and cost. There's also the matter of legacy organisational arrangements and cultural beliefs, which lead us back to the fighter pilot syndrome and to the military industrial complex within which air forces exist. A recent report from the authoritative RAND Corporation suggested that the fighter jock culture may be inhibiting the United States Air Force's development. According to RAND, the USAF is still dominated by fast jet pilots, even though the more technologically diverse set of missions the service is facing demands a broader leadership base. RAND also found that fighter pilots have been somewhat grudging in their acceptance of drones, and that the manned versus unmanned aircraft debate continues to permeate internal service insecurities. Turning to the military industrial complex within which the Air Force operates, it was American President Dwight Eisenhower, previously one of World War II's greatest generals, who in 1961 warned us of the dangers of the self-serving relationship between the military leadership and defence industry. The entire livelihood of both groups depends on keeping long-term programs intact, intact and funded, a mentality which in turn fosters an incremental, risk-averse, status quo approach to force development and which favours the maintenance of traditional systems. Defence companies that make billions from legacy systems are as welcoming of disruptions to their business model as a taxi cab industry has been of Uber and Lyft. Relating this mindset, this culture in other words, to Australia, Andrew Davies from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute has argued that the sunk cost and institutional fondness for the current structure, combined with the industrial landscape and its associated politics, has made the ADF's culture and configuration, for all practical purposes, immutable. Davies sees Australia's defence conglomerate as having neither the courage nor the imagination required to significantly change direction. Applying this mentality specifically to air forces, we might note the inexorable momentum within advanced air forces to develop manned so-called sixth generation fighters and bombers, which surely only the greatest optimist could expect to enter service in less than a quarter of a century and at a price tag less than the GDP of a third world country. To be fair, that same optimist might uh, might point to the RWS futuristic plan Jericho, the purpose of which is to protect Australia from technologically sophisticated and rapidly morphing threats, to push the boundaries of our fifth generation force by exploiting augmented intelligence primarily. But a pessimist might respond by, reply, by referring to real life rather than to reverie. For example, at the start of World War II on land, British and French generals who'd been socialised to believe in the divine right of infantry proved incapable of comprehending the disruptive nature of mechanised warfare and were routed by Germans who'd embraced change, while at sea, admirals who'd been socialised to believe in the divine right of capital ships proved incapable of comprehending the disruptive nature of air power and went down with their ships. Plan Jericho is an admirable initiative which implicitly acknowledges that the RAAF, like all of us, is living in a disruptive world. 
but it remains to be seen whether the project will generate genuine change or will simply sponsor capabilities that will be absorbed into the existing cultural and organisational mindset. In 1921, the great air power theorist Julio Douay wrote that victory smiles upon those who anticipate the changes in the character of war, not upon those who wait to adapt themselves after the changes occur. Coincidentally, 1921 was also the year in which the RWF was established. Australians can be grateful that in the almost 100 years since then, the strike fighter pilots who've dominated their Air Force have delivered a national defence capability of the highest quality. But if we believe that we are indeed experiencing a fourth industrial revolution, then, by definition, the culture that has served the Air Force so well is unlikely to do so in the near future. The essential question facing today's Air Force is whether or not leaders who have been socialised within, uh, within an archaic organisational framework have the right stuff to take their service forward into the 21st century. Thank you.